So last week was supposed to actually be the last week of our Proverbs series. In fact, some of you woke up on Monday of this past week wanting to know where in the heck is the devotional on the GCS page, right? Pastor Jeff never said where we were going next. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm supposed to read my Bible without Pastor Jeff telling me which chapter to read. In fact, Randy Jenkins was trying to plan a revolt and get people to pick it outside of the parsonage because there wasn't a devotional. I I mean, my goodness, I hope that after a year and a half of doing these daily devotionals, maybe that y'all can uh, figure out that if Pastor Jeff doesn't tell you what to read, you can pick up your Bibles and read it for yourself, amen? And maybe even have some conversation on your own, amen? Amen. Amen. But last week, as Pastor Peter was supposed to be preaching the last message from the book of Proverbs, the Lord was speaking to me as I was sitting down there, and he said, no, I got one more message that I want you to preach. I got one more message that I want you to preach from Proverbs. I want you to go back a passage or a chapter, and I want you to look at this verse, a verse that gets a lot of publicity, a verse that gets a lot of play. And oftentimes, this verse is a verse that only the first part you will hear, right? Right? How many of you guys have heard the first part of this verse before? Where there is no vision, the people will perish. No? Nobody. Okay. No hands raised, no yes, no. Come on, talk to me, people. Come on. Um, where there is no vision, the people will perish. But we forget about the second part of the verse. We forget about the second part of the verse. And while oftentimes this verse is seen in a very mystical way, right, where there is no vision, the people will perish. You know, and we sometimes have this idea, okay, well, this vision, this is, this is something that is, that is given from someone, and they have to convey it, and they have to portray it. This isn't a mystical proverb for you to try to figure out. This proverb is actually very practical. In fact, a lot of what I'm going to say to you today is very simplistic. It's very practical. And I hope not to belabor the point because what I would like to do is present this information to you and then I would like us to spend some time in in a closing song of going to the altar or kneeling at your seats and spending time in prayer about this very practical, simplistic thing. And I've entitled the sermon this morning, Do You Want to Be Happy? I mean, how many people, raise a hand this morning, you want to be happy in your life? Come on, I mean, just about everybody wants to be happy. But there are many of us, specifically Christians, who don't live a happy life. How do I know that? You were in church and you're not singing. I know, he keeps bringing that up, man. Folks, folks, the secret to happiness... The secret to happiness is in this proverb. And it's not something that's far off. It's not something that has to be contemplated on for very long. It's very straightforward. How many of you guys are glad this morning? The word of God is very straightforward. That God does not hide his truth, but makes it very simple and understandable to his people. Amen? Amen. Look with me at the verse. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Listen to me, folks. This is what is called a comparative proverb. All right? It's comparing two things to one another, right? You have the first part, where there is no vision, the people perish. Again, when I tell you about vision, the word vision here, the way it's used in the context, it's not mystical. It's not something that's far out. It's not something that you, that, that's super overly spiritual. That's not what we're talking about, how it's used oftentimes in the church today and through a lot of super spiritual people. But it's very practical. How do I know this? Because of the second part of the proverb that it's being compared to. The second part of the proverb says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Folks, how many times have I told you context is very important? Context is very important. You want to know what the vision is, just look at the second part of that proverb. They're comparing two things against each other, right? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. God has always always, always, God has always and always will give 
his vision to his people through his word. Always. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Let's look at the context of this verse. This verse was written to Old Testament saints. It's written to believers, okay? It's proverb, it's Solomon's men handing down these wise sayings, right? And so the vision for these New Testament say, or for these Old Testament saints is the law. That's what it says. You want to know what the vision is? Look at the second part of the verse. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Happy is he is the opposite of where there is no vision, the people perish. Am I making sense to you this morning? Again, I'm trying to explain this as simple as I can, right? So the vision for the Old Testament saints was the law. It is The law is the standard of righteousness and the standard of holiness in the Old Testament. It gave direction to the people of God. Therefore, if an Old Testament saint kept the law, he retained and lived out the vision that God had for his people. What's the law filled with? The law is filled with, this is how I want you to act. This is how I want you to dress. This is how I want you to sacrifice. This is how I want you to interact with one another. This is how I want you to worship. It was his vision. God's vision was the law for his people. And they were to follow it. Now, how do I know this proverb's true? Because every single time you go through the Old Testament and you see the people of God turn away from the law, or not follow the law, or rebuke the law, or pervert the law, you know what happens? Israel perishes. Israel falls off. So every time they lost the vision that God had, things didn't go the way they were supposed to. Whether it be that they were conquered by another group, whether it be that they were run out, whether there were famines, whether there were whatever it is. But you know what you also see in the Old Testament? Every time that Israel abided by the law, followed the law, kept the law, they prospered. They were blessed. They found favor. They were, as the title says, happy. You see, the same word in the Old Testament here that's being translated for happy can also be translated as blessed. It can be translated as blessed. So let's put that word in there, right? But he that keepeth the law, blessed is he. Blessed is he. When you're happy, you see, because you might be saying, well, Pastor Jeff, there's a lot of things that bring happiness in this world. Yes, but that happiness, as scripture tells us, is fleeting and leaves us very quickly. Oftentimes, that happiness of the world is rooted in sin and cannot be sustained. But when you are happy in the Lord, you are happy because you are walking in his law, which leads to you being blessed, which as scripture says means you are highly favored, which then makes you happy. So let me ask you this morning. How many of you want to be happy? Still see the hands raised. That's good. How many of you want to be happy? Because listen to me. The same truth that we find here in Proverbs 29, 18, God's word is eternal. It does not change. It applies to us today. Let me give you some examples. Listen. When the church, when a nation... When an individual abandons God's vision for his people. When a church or when a nation or when an individual abandons the law, mark it down, it always leads to the death of the church, the death of a nation, or the death of an individual. Always. Why? Because they've abandoned the vision that God has had for them. We look around in our world today and we wonder why. In most cases, we see a lukewarm church in the United States of America. 
we've abandoned the vision. We wonder why we see an impotent church in the United States. We've forsaken his word. We wonder why we look around and we see an apostate church in a lot of ways being corrupted by the culture coming into the church rather than the church going out and changing the culture. Why? Because we have lost the vision that God has given us through revealing his word to us. To go and be the salt and light. Rather, we let that come in and set us. We wonder why we see our schools in the way that they are. We wonder why we see our nation filled with violence and people turning against one another. We wonder why we so see so many adults and children on so many different drugs, depressed, filled with stress, filled with anxiety, families falling apart, institutions crumbling. Why? Because we have rejected his vision at every turn. He has revealed it. He's given it to us in written form. He has put it before us and told us what will happen if we follow it. And we have said, now we think we've got something better. And we wonder why the world is perishing. We wonder why our families are perishing. We wonder why our communities are perishing. We wonder why ain't nobody happy, favored, and blessed anymore. Because we're not following the word of God. But can I give you good news this morning? I, I laid on a lot of bad news this morning, but that's okay, because in order for the gospel to be good, you've got to realize the bad, right? Every time Israel realized they had gotten away from the vision, every time they had seen their way that God had for them perish, every time that they realized it and they cried out to God and repented. You know what God did? He provided a way for them to come back. He provided a way. Because you look, notice it says in the verse, look, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Who brought the vision of God's word? The prophet. When the prophet spoke, He was conveying, thus saith the Lord, from the word that they had already revealed. Here's how it applies. Here's how it needs to lead out. And you know what else that prophet did? That prophet would say, here's where you're not following it. He would rebuke the people in love. And you know how oftentimes the Israelites didn't want to hear it? They got hearts of stone. They turned up their nose because what the scriptures say they oftentimes did to the prophet when he came to bring correction and try to get them back on path. It says that they killed the prophet because they didn't want to be confronted with their sin. But praise the Lord, we have a God of grace. And when they finally realized the error of their ways and they cried out to him, God would bring another prophet. God would bring somebody else. He'd raise up someone else. You see, God always has a faithful remnant. Amen, church? And he'd raise them up and he'd bring them in and he would convey the vision to the people again and their hearts would turn and they would get back in line with the law and Israel and their ministry over time would be fulfilled again. It would come back. He can do the same for you this morning. I don't know what maybe you need to take inventory on in your life this morning. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your financials. Maybe it's just your life in general. But listen to me, church. Whatever it is that you have found to be dead and perishing in your life, and, you have, and it is that way because you have forsaken the vision of God that he has for his people through his word, listen to me, it can be resurrected. It can be redeemed. It can be brought back to life. He that keepeth the law, happy is he. You ever wonder this question? Why is someone happy, blessed, when they keep the law? Why is someone happy or blessed 
when they keep the law. Let me give you three things real quick. Number one, it's because the law sets boundaries. By the way, for you today, the law is the word of God. It's the complete revelation that God has given you. It's this book, okay? So when we talk about it in modern terms, that's what it is, right? It sets boundaries. What do I mean by it sets boundaries? This book tells us what's right and what's wrong. This book tells us what is sin and what glorifies God. This book tells us where we can go and where we shouldn't go. What we should partake in and what we should not partake in. This book tells us and sets boundaries. If you do this, you are walking in the will of God. If you do this, you're walking in the ways of man. It sets boundaries. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, aren't you more happy when you have guidance on things in your life? Aren't you more happy so to speak, when you have direction (laughs) on things in your life. I mean, Jacob and I, uh, not Jacob and I, Caleb and I were, uh, Caleb got a basketball hoop for his birthday. That's what he wanted. So you drive by the parsonage now, you see this tremendous basketball hoop out in our driveway. It took me four hours to put it together. I don't want to hear a word. (laughs) Four hours to put it together. You know what would have been absolutely frustrating in putting that hoop together? If it did not come with directions. I wouldn't have even known where to start. I struggled even with the directions. Because for those of you who know me, I'm not very inclined to those sorts of things, right? Amen, there you go. Let my wife start it off. I heard her. By the way, Gary, there's another problem with the parsonage. Might need you to come by. Um, anyway, not the basketball hoop. Listen, listen, listen. I needed that guidance. I needed that direction. I needed instructions so that way, not only can I be happy and fulfill a project, but now my kids can be happy because they get to shoot hoops in the in the basket in the in the driveway. You need guidance and direction. Proverbs says it's the fool who casts off restraint. Who casts off the guidelines. Who casts off the boundaries. It's the fool. And usually, as scripture tells us, the fool is the one that winds up perishing. So why are you happy and blessed when you keep the law? Number one, it sets boundaries. Number two, it gives understanding. The law gives understanding for God's people. The word of God gives understanding for his people. What does it help you understand? Three key questions that you hear philosophers and and, uh, people speculate about all throughout the history of the universe. Where you came from, who you are, and why you're here. Those are fundamental for you to have happiness in your life is for you to understand them. Most times you hear people who are depressed. They don't know why they're here. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know. They don't know. It's all these what ifs. It's all these question marks in their life. You know what the Bible tells you? It tells you where you came from. It says you were made and you were fashioned out of the dust of the earth. You were formed in the belly of your mama. You had a purpose put on you. You had a plan put on you. It tells you where you're from. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And by the way, God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. You have been formed and fashioned the way you are in the image of God to give him glory. It tells you who you are. It tells you who you are. If you're saved here this morning, you're a child of God. That's what it says. It says you have been bought with a price. You have been engrafted into the family of God. You are a child of the king. You have an inheritance waiting for you. And it's all possible through Jesus Christ. But listen to me. If you're here this morning and you are not saved, that Bible tells you who you are. Even though you are made in the image of God, you've got sin that has scarred you, sin that has separated you. And you are not a child of God if you're not saved. You are a child of the devil. And you don't have an inheritance. You have a judgment and a punishment coming for your sin. 
and you need to be saved. It puts it in black and white. It puts it right out there for you. But not only it tells you who you are, it tells you why you are here. Listen to me, whether you're saved or whether you're not saved here this morning, listen to me, why you're here is the same thing. You were created to give glory to God. You were created to give glory to God. You can only fulfill while you are here. You can only fulfill your mission and your purpose into why you are here. If you are saved, if you're not saved, it leaves question marks all along the way. But it gives understanding. The word of God removes the confusion. That's what vision does, right? It removes the confusion. It answers the questions. It gives you proper direction. You do not have to wonder or guess on any of the major things in life. It's all there for you. And you can take God's word to the bank because he's the one that hung the moon and the stars and put the universe into place. He's the one that ordered the days and the nights and the months and the years. He is the one that holds all things together. If he does that and can keep that, by God, I'd take his word for it as to why I'm here, who I am, and what I'm supposed to be doing. Not only that, it sets boundaries, it gives understanding, but you can be happy by keeping the law because it brings revelation. It brings revelation. When you read the law, when you're in the book, you know what it does? It reveals to you your problem. By the way, every single one of us were born with a problem. It's the problem of sin. This word, when you're in it, it points it out. It shows you that you're a sinner and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. It shows that your righteousness and trying to save yourself is as filthy rags. This word, though, also tells you there is an answer for your problem. <laughs> And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die on a cross, to have his blood shed as the perfect lamb of God so no other sacrifice would ever have to be made. He went into the grave. He came out and beat death and hell. He came and he resurrected from the dead. He ascended back into heaven. And by the way, Scripture says he's coming back again. And that if you want to take care of your problem, all you need to do is see yourself as the sinner that Scripture tells you you are. Because a sinner needs a Savior, and it has revealed the Savior to you. It's Jesus Christ. And by grace, through faith, you can be made whole. By grace, through faith in his finished work, you can be saved. It shows your problem. It shows your need. It shows your task. You know what this word does and to why it makes you happy? Because once you're saved, it tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go into the world and preach the gospel. You're supposed to be the salt and the light of the earth. You're supposed to be someone who brings other people to know faith in Jesus Christ. You can now fulfill your mission and worship the Lord and bring glory to his name because now you know why you go to church. Now you know why you want to gather together and sing. Now you know why scripture says to lift up holy hands and songs unto the Lord. Now you know why you love being in the fellowship of the saints. Because you're fulfilling exactly what it is that God has called you to be. It reveals not just your purpose, not just your future. Oh, that's the other thing. It reveals your future, by the way. Everybody wants to know where they're going. Guess what? If you're a, if you're a saved individual, guess where you're going? Guess what? You don't have to guess. You can know. You're going home to glory one day. I would hope that gets people a little more excited, especially with the hell on earth we live in today. You're going home to glory one day. Did you know that you're going home to glory one day and the enemy has no say in the matter anymore? You've been saved out of judgment. You've been saved out of hell. You've been saved out of the fire. You've been saved out of the wrath of God by Jesus Christ. You're going home to glory. You're going to be going home to streets of gold. You got your mansion over the hilltop. It reveals to you your future destination. A new body redeemed, made perfect in the presence of God forever and ever and ever and ever. Will you praise his name in the midst of his saints? Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just your destination, but it tells you, and you can be happy because you know the world's destination. 
Newsflash, I know it's bad. The devil don't win. Did you know that? The enemy doesn't win. Satan is a loser now, and he's going to be a loser for eternity. Amen? Jesus said, behold, I have come to make all things new. One day Christ will return if, he hasn't, if we haven't gone home to be in glory with him. One day he will come, he will rule, he will reign, he will make all things new. It says that the old heaven, the old earth pass away, behold, the new heaven comes down. It is integrated, it is remade, it is refined, and we will dwell for him, with him before the throne of God forever and ever and ever. You know your destination, you know what's coming. And you can be happy because let me tell you, there are depressing things that happen in this world. There's depressing things happening in the news. Depressing things that are happening in our nation. Depressing things that are happening in our church. And listen to me, if you know how the story ends and you believe you know how the story ends and you know the one who holds the story at the end, you can have joy, unspeakable joy. You can be happy because you're keeping the law. Because you're keeping the law. You can be happy because it sets boundaries. It gives understanding. It brings revelation. Listen to me. Do you want to be happy? (laughs) Do you want to be happy? How many of you guys want to be happy still? You want to be happy? You see, it lays out. Right? But he that keepeth the law happy is he. Listen. You want to have a blessed church? The law has a vision for that. You want to be a blessed church? Acts chapter 9, keep the vision of the risen Savior in your sight. You want to be a blessed church? Keep the vision of New Jerusalem in your sight, Revelation 21. You want to be a blessed church? Keep the harvest field in your sight. You follow those things and understand that we are here amen to praise the risen savior we're here amen because we're going home to glory one day we're here amen because we're called out to evangelize and to get the harvest and the souls that are still out there that need to be harvested you keep that in mind and you follow that vision you'll be a blessed church you want a blessed nation he's got a vision for that in his in his word you know what it says psalm thirty three twelve. Blessed is the nation whose God is Lord. Amen. You want a blessed nation? Follow the Lord. Follow his precepts. Follow his word. And if you're not doing it, he gives you a pathway back to it. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their lands. You want a blessed nation? He's got a vision for that in his word. You want a blessed marriage? Got quiet. You want a blessed marriage? Ephesians chapter 5, he's got a vision for that, where you see the picture of marriage. We talked about it two weeks ago on my message, where you've got the church, uh, the church and Jesus. It's symbolism. The man plays the role of Christ. The woman plays the role of the church. And when you meet those scriptural standards and you live out those scriptural callings, it glorifies your, your marriage and it glorifies Jesus Christ. And guess what? You want to fulfill happy wife, happy life? He's got a vision for that in his word. Come on. You want your your children to be blessed? He's got a vision for that. There's the vision of parenting. Colossians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. It tells you how to raise your child, how to get the most out of them, what things you need to put in place for them. By the way, discipline is a good thing. Amen. Amen. Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's in Proverbs. You want a vision for parenting? It says train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. If your child is living in your house, I don't care if they're 18, if they're under your roof, set the standard, make them follow it, 
and raise them in the way of the Lord until they're on their own. Trust me, the world's going to pour in all kinds of crap to your child. And yes, I said crap from the pulpit because that's what it is. You need to be sure you are pouring in the things of God to your child. Because if you don't, (laughs) the world will definitely fill it and take its place. You want blessed financials? There's a vision for that. Guess what? We're going to spend the next couple weeks talking about that vision. That's where we're going next. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He's got a vision for that. Stewardship and tithing. You want to be happy? You want to be fulfilled? You want to find favor? You want to be blessed in that area? Follow the vision that God has laid out in his word. You want a blessed life? Remember how I told you happy and blessed? Synonymous in the translation? You want a blessed life? Jesus, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, lays out what a blessed life looks like. Matthew chapter 5, we know them as the Beatitudes, right? Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he. You can take blessed out there and you can also put happy in. Happy is he. You want to have a blessed life? You want to find favor? Follow what Christ commands in the Beatitudes. Keep them there. You want to have a blessed life? How many of you guys feel like you're overpressured? I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. Right? There's not enough time in a day. There's so much stuff. And it, 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 just, it just takes the life out of you. <laughs> you always feel constrained and under pressure. Guess what? You want to have a blessed life? He's got a vision in the Old Testament for that. You want to know what it is? It's found in Exodus chapter 18 and 19. It's called Remember the Sabbath Day and Keep It Holy. It means that no matter what's going on in your life and how stressful it is, make sure you are taking your time to be in the presence of God and worship him. Because last I checked, he is a redeemer of the time. Therefore, if you think you don't have time to do something, if you think you don't have the minutes or hours or seconds in the day to accomplish anything, guess what? Phasing God out of that plan isn't going to give you more time to get it done. In fact, it's going to frustrate you in trying to get done what you're supposed to do. Lay aside the time, worship the one that holds time in his hands, and watch him redeem the time for you to be blessed. You see, we just got to follow the vision. Go ahead, start playing in the background, or I'm going to keep preaching. <laughs> Listen to me. Bow your heads, close your eyes with me this morning. That would probably even be better. Bow your head, close your eyes with me this morning. Listen to me. What in your life is not abiding by the vision that God has laid out in his word? What area, what aspect in your life is perishing. It may not be dead yet, but it's getting there because you've forsaken his vision, you've forsaken his word, and you try to do your own thing. And in the meantime, you know what that does? It's made you miserable. It's made you depressed. It's made you (laughs) stress-filled. Folks, I want to invite you to bring it before the altar of God this morning. Because whatever area that is, again, the good news is that he can resurrect. Last I checked, our God's in the resurrection business. Amen? Our God's in the revival business. And when we go to him with a repentful spirit, he will never turn us away. But he will invite us in. You know what else I love about this verse? Look, we live, in a, we live in a culture, whatever it is that God is putting on your heart right now that's about your life or something in your life that you've wandered away from the vision of, you know, it's, you, but pastor, everybody else is doing it. But pastor, that's what our culture says is right. Pastor, that's what the world says is okay, even though it goes against, you know what I love? It says in the proverb, where there is no vision, the people perish. The people perish. The people perish. Plural, group. 
But you know what the second half says? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. It it does a contrast. What that says to me is just because everybody else around you is doing it is no excuse for you to do it. He gives you, the individual, he or she, the opportunity to follow that law for yourself regardless of the perishing in the rest of the world. It's your decision. It's your opportunity. Maybe you need to just cry out to the Lord this morning. Father, I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm upset with myself. I'm frustrated. I feel like I'm at my wit's end, and it's because I'm going against your vision through your word for my life. I want to be happy. I want to enjoy your blessing. I want to walk in your favor. Lord, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be tough to turn it around, but Lord, I come before you this morning, and I lay it down at your feet. Lord, I can't do this alone. I can't do this on my own will, but Lord, I can only do it by your power and your might and your Holy Spirit that you have given me. After all, the old Sunday school song must have been true. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Lord, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the timing of it. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy that even when we find ourselves in the midst of sin, when we find ourselves being out uh, and, and casting away your word, Father, your grace is abundant and we can always come back. Father, I pray for not just the congregation this morning. I pray for myself, Lord. I ask, Lord, as the psalmist declared, that you would search me and you would know my heart, that you would test me and know my anxious thoughts. Lord, that if there be any offensive ways in me, that you would show me and you would lead me in the ways everlasting. And Lord, the ways of everlasting are returning to your word. Lord, I want the vision you have for my life. Lord, I want to walk in ways of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, I want to be blessed. I want to be highly favored. I want to be able to do your will and do your work for your honor and glory because by God, that's what I was put here for. Oh, Father, may we humbly come to your feet this morning. May we lay ourselves down and may we say, have thine own way. Father, may it not be an emotional response here this morning, but Father, may it be a conviction of the heart that when we leave the altar today, that when we leave this place today, that it would carry on, not just through the rest of Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday, and you bring us safely back and we build on it going into Sunday and the next day and the next day and the next day, because Lord, your word, Christ said, or Paul said, I died daily to the things of this flesh. Father, we want to cast off those things. We want to be enveloped with your Holy Spirit only today. We thank you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Say it with me, congregation. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's stand to our feet.